Hello and welcome. On this episode, we're going to be putting a neat little bow on all the news that came out of the last weekend, including Kevin Magnussen and his race ban, Franco Colapinto's debut for Williams, and the possibility of F1 having a potential young driver race in its future. Well, joining me once again to discuss it all, I'm delighted to have Jake Boxall Leg, aka JBL, and Phil Clearan, who doesn't have an AKA. Never mind, gents, welcome along. Going to start with you, JBL. Kevin Magnussen, F1's biggest agent of chaos, has picked up a point for Haas, finishing 10th, but not without controversy, was it? Because he received a 10 second time penalty and his 11th and 12th points penalties for colliding with Pierre Gasly, meaning that he'll be the first F1 driver to be banned from a race since Roman Grosjean back in 2012. What are your thoughts? Was it a fair penalty, first of all? And also, should we have a system that ultimately kicks a driver out after too many offences on track? Well, I'll start with the last question first, because it <laughs> should add a little bit of context. Um, yeah, I th- I'll be honest, Like, I know there's people that kind of have a problem with the system and maybe it penalises menial offences too much. But ultimately, I think it's a good thing. It stops drivers from continually involving in what one would deem dangerous driving, repeated infractions, that kind of thing. Um, it tries to keep everything fair. How those are applied maybe could be, uh, let's say, looked at a little bit better for greater consistency because... It appears, you know, some offences are penalised and some aren't. And then at the next race, it'll be vice versa. But ultimately, I think the system is good. And I think 12 is sort of like a big enough number for it to, let's say, only really punish those that really, really cross the line on multiple occasions. And so therefore, I agree that it should be a race ban for reaching 12 points. But I don't think Magnussen should have got the two points for that instant. From my point of view, I've watched the instant multiple times now. And it's the most nothing innocuous. He's locked up. They make a little bit of wheel-to-wheel contact. Nobody's hurt. Nobody's got damage. There's no real repercussions from the incident. It's treated exactly the same as Nico Hulkenberg playing pinball with Yuki Tsunoda in turn one. Uh, it's treated exactly the same as Max Verstappen and, and, and Lando Norris at Austria this was so innocuous it was like a little trip and the referee might blow their whistle in a game of football and it's like a very sort of like indirect free kick that kind of thing no yellow card no nothing but it's being penalized as harshly as some of Magnuson's bigger I think the the Logan Sargent crash at Miami that also got two penalty points and a 10 second time penalty so you're equating those two instances uh, I don't think that they're anywhere near similar in magnitude did Gasly get off and get out of it a little bit? Yeah, sure, but I think most drivers would. Gasly didn't agree with the penalty either, so I think Magnussen has every right to feel aggrieved by it, and he shouldn't have got those two penalty points in my point of view. I think other people will disagree, but that was my point of view. It seems like lots of drivers, though, didn't agree with it. Fernando Alonso didn't agree with it. Any driver that was interviewed says that I think it's a bit harsh. Now, do you think, with that in mind, uh, JBL, there should be some kind of review system that allows the drivers to do it like in football if there's a a sending off you could then appeal a sending off do you think there should be a way and maybe the wheels are in process already to to try to reverse that appeal and say look he was given multiple penalties that equated to the the crime maybe the crime and the punishment should fit uh there is an appeals process in place for for those sorts of incidents um usually you have to exercise your right to appeal um, you have to submit requests to do so. And that is only accompanied with, is there any new and significant evidence? And if there is, your right to appeal might be get moved on to an actual appeal. Um, but it's quite a long process. And by that point, I don't think they're going to realistically suspend Magnussen's ban for, for Azerbaijan to do so. I think ultimately for them it's probably a little bit easier to not do the appeal, not spend the, the the cash that you need to do. Take the hit on it, pop Behrman in the car or whoever, and uh, Magnussen comes back in Singapore with a nice clean licence, no points on his licence. Because ultimately, if even if the appeal is successful, it might happen again a little bit later in the season. Um, so you kind of have to pick your battles there a little bit, and I don't entirely see an appeal going down here. But I could be wrong. 
Yeah, I mean, you're not often wrong. So um, I think that's what you wanted me to say, wasn't it? No. <laughs> no. Uh, on that, it's like it's like being given a penalty, isn't it, in football when the defender that tripped the, the attacker being sent off as well. It's a real double whammy just there. Uh, and I'm not sure opinion of other drivers will come into the appeal process. But Phil, staying with pretty much what J-Bell just said, it, also the first time we're hearing you on this video, by the way, so it's great to have you along. Um, with this in place, with K-Mag losing out his position in Baku, Oliver Behrman, as JBL says, likely to step in his place just there in a week or so's time. What do you reckon? Should Haas just just get it done? Just go, I'll tell you what, Behrman, you're in for the rest of the season now and just get the deal done. It would be harsh on him. I can, I can sort of see why, because obviously, you know, Magnussen is a present and Behrman is a future because he's going to be their driver next year. So there is an argument to be made for fast tracking that and sort of take an advance on, on, on Behrman's learning curve, if you will. But yeah, it would be harsh on Magnussen. Um, clearly, Behrman has shown that he can jump in and, and deliver and score points, as he's done with Ferrari when he deputized for Carlos Sainz in, in Saudi Arabia. So I don't think there's a question of uh, Haas necessarily taking a big hit in the short term by putting a rookie in. But yeah, it depends on what, what the deal is with Magnussen uh, and it depends also on Ferrari because Behrman is a Ferrari driver first and foremost. Is he going to be their reserve or are they going to need him on standby uh, for the rest of the season? Is that maybe you know prohibiting Haas from, from taking him as well? So I think there's a few moving parts here. Um, but yeah, I can see why they would do it. I would think it's harsh, but it, it is Formula One, so it, it's not out of the question. No, so no, it's going to be good to see Oliver Behrman on a full race weekend, though, isn't it? See him going through all the different stages of it. And as JBL said, K-Mag will then come back with a nice clean license and can do what K-Mag does for the remaining seven races of the season, maybe even helping out Haas along the way and Nico Hulkenberg. Now, JBL, let's talk about a debutant, another debutant in F1, and that is Franco Colapinto. He was a late call-up by Williams, as we know, in replacement of Logan Sargent. He was knocked out of Q1, but then recovered to finish 12th overall. How do you evaluate or how did you evaluate his performance? I was quite impressed. Um, and I think he did everything that Williams kind of expected him to do. Um, if we sort of roll back through the sergeant removal from the team, it was clear that Williams felt that he was nowhere near close enough to Albon and wasn't really progressing. And that was the key thing. And so they wanted to find a driver that was going to progress that over the last nine races or so was going to sort of show a glide path of gradual improvement getting close to Albon helping the team in the constructors championship because they are kind of embroiled in a battle with Alpine um over points someone that was going to get the most out of the the new upgrades that are coming so I think that was the key thing there and Colapinto seems to be a sort of very wise head took it sort of step by step through the weekend and by FP3 he was up to P9 just uh, a fraction off Albon's fastest time he did make a couple of mistakes in, in qualifying, which led to a Q1 exit. I don't necessarily think he would have gone through anyway, because I don't think his, the lap on his, the, the sectors on his final lap, sorry, were, were quite good enough until the sort of second Lesmo off. But nonetheless, he still did a very, very solid job. And in the race, pretty much made no mistakes. Um, I think it's hard to kind of pinpoint where he had, looking at his race pace as well, very, very close to Albon, got the hard tyre stint to, to it managed to extend it to a one stopper yeah sure he had to deal with graining and that kind of thing but he'd, he'd never driven on the hard tyres before never had to do that level of tyre management never driven 53 laps consecutively in a Formula 1 car so I was very very impressed by him and yeah looking forward to seeing how he progresses over the next few races it's, it's a very exciting time isn't it both especially when you think about 2025 and the sheer number of rookies that are going to be in the in the seats in the season rookies mostly by by nature as opposed to by name because we've got what Oliver Behrman he's going to be in there Jack Doohan's going to be in there there's going to be Kimi Antonelli there may be Liam Lawson if you hear what Helmut Marco says we just don't know but there's going to be maybe around about 20% of the grid all made up of rookies it's pretty exciting what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah it is exciting I mean there's always uh, a clamour for more rookies and more opportunities for young drivers um, and maybe some some older drivers overstaying their welcome so it is exciting. I think you know, we also don't have to exaggerate with just asking teams to put in rookies because then you just end up with 20, 24-year-olds and, and all the all sort of established world champions uh, are going to be chased out. So there's a there's a balance there between experience and between you know, youth. And, and it, it's interesting to see because obviously Antonelli is higher rated 
Behrman is very highly rated. Um, Lawson, yeah, he's overdue a chance because he deserves to be in a car. Like Duan, um, is also a really good driver. Um, he's probably ha maybe has more to prove than than the others because he hasn't really um, received a chance uh, in an F1 car. Obviously, his FP1 in Canada was cut short after what one lap or two laps. So, so yeah, it is exciting, and especially Antonelli. I'm really looking forward to what he can do in in Mercedes if that car is good. I'm looking forward to it as well, and I think you know after last season's um, really really static, silly season. It's good to see new people getting an opportunity. And I think, you know, a lot of criticisms kind of leveled at drivers for, as Phil has kind of said, overstaying their welcome and clinging on for too long. Again, teams find value in experience, but at some point, you know, you've got to give a, a rookie a go because you've got to bring in that next generation. You can't cling on to the same 20 drivers forever. And, you know, Antonelli and Behrman, they've not had great seasons in, in Formula 2. Um, a lot of that has been very, very car dependent. It's been a very, very strange year there. And it, it reminds me back when I used to work there and we had the um, 2018 car come out. And it was very, very clear that some teams had kind of got the memo and some of them hadn't. Um, you know, ART and Prema, for example, off the bat, very, very good with that car. Um, but the fact that Dams and Carlin were kind of in the championship fight that year, that was a testament to, I think, Albon and Norris and their skill. Um but it seems to be much, much more spread out with this new car. Um, so it's not really showing the driver's skills as much. It's more showing the the, the team's ability to get a setup right. Um, so I think that's maybe why some people sort of cast a little bit of doubt on it. But I think Hanson Lee showed in the lap and a half that he's very, very strong. Behrman is shown in his Saudi race that he's very, very good. Um, Dewan is... Phil has said, look, the jury is still out on him, but I think, you know, very, very good driver. I think he'll be very, very astute. He's done a lot of testing for Alpine, done a few FP1 sessions as well. Um, and the opportunity to have the do and name on the grid, um, if you're a fan of motorcycle racing as well, that's really, really cool as well. So um, looking forward to seeing how they all get on. Um, looking forward to sort of doing our first analysis of them. And there might be more to follow, as you say. You know, Lawson only done a few F1 races. Might have an opportunity as well. And maybe there'll be a surprise uh, extra rookie as well. Who knows? Lint in your eye there, JB Allen. If you know something, maybe you don't. But i tell you what. No, he says if you're listening to the podcast... No, he just shrugged his shoulders. He doesn't know. It's purely, <laughs> purely up in the air, that one. But look, we will have to wait and see on that. I'm just a quick one on you, uh, for you, Phil. Um, it's been publicly revealed... I suppose is the best way of saying it. There's a possibility of a young driver race during post-testing in Abu Dhabi as a way to give drivers an alternative uh, way of getting drivers in the cars, really, and giving them some seat time and some experience as well ahead of a, a full debut. Do you think this is, a, first of all, do you think this is a good idea? And secondly, is it viable? How did it all come together? Well, I think the idea really originated with just the lack of opportunities in general and lack of testing. Every team has two FP1 slots that it has to give to a rookie. And then f teams are free to test old cars like Antonelli has been doing, like Behrman has been doing, doing. But, you know, first of all, that's expensive. And not every team has, has an old car or has a, a TPC car or a test team to, to do it. For example, if you look at Sauber, they couldn't do testing with Pusher because they, they didn't have the means to do it. They didn't have the, uh, the car or the team ready to, to go testing. So I think this is a good idea because all the teams are there, all the cars are there. They'll be deprecated after the, the race because it's the final Grand Prix of the season. So it doesn't matter if there's crash damage or you, you, know, or you need spare parts. You're not going to have to build anymore because you, you just race with what you still have. So it is sort of a, a low cost and a low... I guess low risk, low stakes way of 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 giving young drivers not just some some FP one time where there's you know there's nothing at stake, but if if you can give them a whole race weekend, uh, a couple of practice sessions, qualifying a full race in an F one car or a sprint race uh, is the idea rather than full one. You know that that is going to be hugely beneficial because that's a lot of miles that they otherwise wouldn't get, plus the added competition that otherwise you wouldn't get. So. I'm more for it. Um, it seems like pretty much every team is is in agreement because exactly what I said, not everybody can just go a test and everything is already in place to, to hold up for that race. So I do think it's it makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons and I hope to see it happen because it'll be very exciting. 
Yeah, certainly will. A testing scenario is very, very different to a racing scenario, isn't it? Well, thank you very much, as always, there, gents. That's just about it for today. Let us know in the comments what you made of Colapinto's debut and would you watch a young driver race? Tell us your thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to subscribe. And make sure you tune in next time where we'll be previewing the Azerbaijan Grand Prix from the streets of Baku. Until then, though, thanks for watching.